This is Reasonable Doubt with your hosts, Mark Garrigus and Adam Carolla. Yeah, get it on. Got to get on a choice with on mandate. Get it on and welcome to the best hour or so in the universe. It's Reasonable Doubt. Adam Carolla, Mark Garrigus in studio once again. Uh, not only in studio, but I don't know about you. Did you come from Malibu? Did you... Did you no. get? Did you have to avoid traffic in the Hollywood for the Netflix walkout over Dave Chappelle? Is that what was going on? Oh yeah. Is yeah. there is there traffic There's interruption? There's traffic because the um, apparently it's a it's a walkout of employees at Netflix over the Dave Chappelle um, uh, special, which is on their platform, which has taken. The uh, we've uh, we've left the sublime and entered into the ridiculous. ridiculous. Yeah. Well, you know, it's kind of it's interesting. Uh, first off, lay the land. So Netflix is where KTLA is or was or or something. It shares the same city block, right down on Sunset, a uh, little bit uh, west of Western or north of Western. I can never really figure out what direction it is, but it's, it's right in the heart of Hollywood. Right. And uh, so one could interrupt things if one wanted to interrupt traffic. But did you were they physically walking out and going into the streets? Yes. And apparently because it had garnered some maybe Gary's got some footage. It had gathered some steam. They had that move the locations. Apparently they sent out a um, due to overwhelming response to the rally. We're moving the walk out to the Netflix office close by at 1341 Vine. Oh, Vine. So uh, they have I, multiple offices. In yeah. Hollywood. So they've they've done sort of what Disney's done out here. The mm-hmm. campuses, and they just keep they just keep uh, yeah they just keep spreading things out. I've always yeah, it's it's funny uh, to Disney. So Disney's up the street. When I bought this warehouse, I don't know, eighteen years ago, maybe nineteen years ago. Um, there was nothing going on. There was no Home Depot. There was no Disney. There was no anything. But Disney was starting to, like, franchise. They were starting to build out from where they were in Burbank. And um, people would say to me, hey, what are you doing with this warehouse? It's sort of middle of nowhere. nothing going on or whatever. I'd, I'd, I'd say, well, I'm going to do my podcast there. And then uh, one day... Disney's going to buy me out. And, and they'd, <laughs> they'd go, they're like... going to buy the podcast? And I go, no, no, they're going to buy the land and demolish the building. I'm not, I'm not uh, expecting And by to be... the way, the, you, to get here is the easiest thing in the world because you just, is right off the freeway off ramp. It is, uh, it is conveniently located. So, they've, so that's kind of an interesting thing. And, and people... I think people, you and I cir- circle back to this a lot. Uh, it, it's not really about whether you agree or disagree. You have to, uh, politically, you have to kind of think about the action. So, you know, this start, this has been going on for a while. But Tom Cotton was trying to do an op-ed in the New York Times a year and whatever ago about uh, Wuhan and uh, lab leak the and lab stuff like leak, that. Exactly. And uh, they took it down and the young employees of the New York Times wanted nothing to do with it. And they were essentially dictating policy from a cubicle. Now, it used to be the guy in the corner office would dictate the policy. Now it's the guys on the factory floor that are dictating policy. And I think people sort of in general like this in a kind of Norma Ray, you know, way where the poor factory workers being exploited and now they need to push back against the man – but that was because they were using lead in their paint at the refrigerator factory and all the factory workers were being poisoned by lead. This is Dave Chappelle doing a fucking stand-up special. It is not that. I think people almost sort of go along with it reflexively like, oh, I see the, um, you know, the poor guys down on the first floor are, are pushing back against the guy in the penthouse which thematically we enjoy as a society. But what if the poor guys are a bunch of fucking babies 
who are, are, are the product of a self-esteem movement and have no fucking idea how to run a company. Well, also, by the way, and the poor head of Netflix, they uh, there was an interview with him yesterday where he had to kind of walk back statements he had made or a couple of emails he said. I don't know if you saw this, and he had to concede. Gary may find it. Yeah, I've, I've seen it. Ted yeah. Sarandos, you know, he, he tried to be strong at the beginning of this, right. and then a mob of people went, we're going to take a fine-tooth comb, and then two days went by, and now he's backing off. Yeah. Right. And, and he has to concede that, yes, words can hurt. Yeah, and there, there was a... I'm, I'm actually reading... <laughs> I'm actually reading a great list of demands from people who are behind the walkout, and there's like 20 of them, and none of them have to do with Dave Chappelle. Yeah. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. My, yeah. it's a, it's all it is is a rallying cry for a list of grievances that are. It's like, dude, you do you want to work or you don't want to work? Because if you take a look at some of these things, you say to yourself. Do you understand that this is a workplace? This isn't your. These aren't your parents. Well, I I'd say that this thing kind of started with the self esteem movement, which is if everyone feels like they're number one and everyone feels special and everyone feels as as if they walk and their feet don't touch the ground, then how many of those people can you employ before these things happen? But uh, I think COVID kind of added creatine to the mix because now it's all been sort of turbocharged because people are like, I don't need to go into work. Like I don't need, you know, and, and by the way, that part where you're sort of examining how much you need to work versus lifestyle versus enjoyment versus leisure time. These are decisions that should be made in your mid sixties. Not uh, when you're fucking 27, I was just going to say, if you want to live that lifestyle, more power to you. Go earn the money. Go, go do something right. and get to a point where you can determine it. I mean, it's just the, the uh, like I said, someday somebody's going to look back at this and they're just going to, they're going to say th- th- there was a collective nervous or a collective unconscious that had seeped in and there was a societal nervous breakdown. I don't even understand. Um, I don't understand. Gary, do you have the list? Did you put it up? Because if you see some of these, I can read you're it to you. Say, what does this have to do with Dave Chappelle? I can tell you if anyone, if this screw, this uh, screw, this uh, crew here uh, ever decided to walk out and gave me their list of grievances, they'd all be food based. <laughs> I don't think there'd be a lot of talk about equality. I don't think there'd be talking about work conditions. I think it'd be it's a little like more hummus want, based. Well, yeah, how come you're not buying us lunch? By the way, have he you denied been, me access. I denied to lunch. him access to lunch by not buying him. By lunch. the way, for all you Netflix employees, let me tell you something. I've been to your to your main hub. I have too. Right. Um, that is about as good a work spot as I have ever seen in my entire life. If you want to hear Adam rant, I can read the first however many of these it takes before he interrupts and screams at me. Please. I, I, listen, I've been there. First off, it's, you know, lobby of polished marble mixed with, you know, uh, food stations that have 26 <laughs> options in yeah. your coffee. It's yeah. not three. You no, know? I, it's, it is like Disneyland for your brain. I when, when we, you know... Providing access to lunch. When I was coming up, <laughs> if you went to a place that even had coffee, the choices were coffee or decaf coffee. Right. And then they had a cylinder of something that didn't even say creamer on it. It said whitener. <laughs> You could change the color of your coffee if you so prefer. So for the lawyers who are listening, I do a lot of mediations. And there are JAMS, which is Judicial Arbitration Mediation Service. There's ADR. There's uh, Judicate West and Signature. I judge the mediations by who puts out the best spread and has the right. best machines. And for a while, um, ADR had great, and then they kind of fell by the wayside. Judicate West really upped their game and at a certain point trumped jams, but now it's Signature. And so Signature – and by the way, Signature is drawing the most retired judges because everybody wants to go there to spend the day there. It's uh, the best investment you can make in your company because uh, you're speaking of ADR, all the sound mixing houses that uh, used to reside in Hollywood, probably still there. 
you'd go in there, you'd loop things, you'd go in there and you'd record commercials, you'd go in there and do voiceover stuff, all, all that stuff. It was based on their kitchen. Right. The the ones that had, you know, regular M&M and peanut <laughs> M&Ms, that's that's the place you would book. That that's how it works. You've got a you've got an absolute kind of draw. It's an attractive nuisance. Gary, All right, go ahead. Gary has got some pent up demands here. All right. Uh, well, we'll leave my demands for later. We'll stick mm-hmm. with Netflix uh, first. In the heading of content investment, create a new fund specifically developed trans and non-binary talent. This fund should support both above the line and below the line talent. This fund should exist in addition to the existing creative equity fund. They should inque- increase investment in trans and non-binary content on Netflix comparable to our total investment in transphobic content, including marketing and promotion. They should give a talk show, Netflix, to the new uh, health and human services uh, guy, gal. Did you, see, uh, did you see that one? No. We have our like first trans. Oh, wait. Yes, I've seen her. I've seen her. The doctor. Yeah. With the long gray hair. Yeah, that's a, it's interesting, but right. sorry, go ahead. Uh, You're being transphobic. Yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, Rachel Levine, the former uh, Pennsylvania Department of Health and Health Secretary, is who you guys are talking about. I've, yeah, I've seen her, um, her right. PSAs. They're very sorry. effective. <laughs> Further on the list, uh, invest in multiple trans creators to make both scripted and unscripted programs across genres. Revise internal processes on commissioning and releasing potentially harmful, quote, sensitive content, including but not limited to involving parties who are part of a subject community who can speak to potential harm or consulting with third party experts and vendors. How much of this? It's it's kind of interesting uh, psychologically. First off, I always love when the woke eat themselves. So right. it's always satisfying <laughs> when the, the guys that are working hard at being woke eventually get devoured by their own because that's that's how it goes. It's essentially a lifeboat. Fat guys going first, but eventually they're going to eat everyone on that right. on that the lifeboat. Fat, right. But it's it's also interesting and it, it's psychologically interesting, which is. You are Netflix or you are HBO or you are whomever. You provide entertainment. Um, you don't change the world. You don't affect the zeitgeist of America. Oh, you don't, you oh, don't make us think a different way about the trans community. You guys really he's are days, clowns, He's three days behind, isn't he, Gary? I isn't know. that? That's what the president of Netflix said three days ago. Oh, really? Oh. I didn't even hear Ted Sarantos. That was and what he tried to say. That's and what that's he tried he's to say three days ago. Oh. And, and they he's been beaten like a baby you, seal you, into submission. Adam just canceled himself. Yeah. Oh. You just canceled yourself. You make entertainment. Say. Nobody no. listens to you. <laughs> How dare you? How dare you? Wait, wasn't that the headline yeah. this morning? Yeah. I think really? that was the headline. Wow. I made a mistake. It's not really entertainment. We affect people. We this we hurt people. It's it's unbelievable. But but these are the same people who essentially scoffed at Tipper Gore and whomever religious right who were talking about the evils of rock and roll Correct. and rap music. Correct. They were like, you know, these guys rapping about their hoes and packing heat and pimping and like that's going to affect our young community. And everyone's like, well, it's art. Them. They can say what they want. They video. mocked How them. about video games? Right. How about They're, the old right. video game? You're poisoning your kids, man. And everyone, these people were the ones who were doing the mocking. I'm going to tease something right after this. Because first, we've got somebody who's new to RD, Masterworks.io. There's an unspoken rule to the universe. They call it the power law. Did you Mm -hmm. know this? No, I don't know about it. It means that 99% of society's rewards are awarded to a privileged 1% of the population. Well, not anymore. A law called the Jobs Act has leveled the playing field for investors, opening up exclusive investments like contemporary art. Before this, less than 1,000 people in the world could invest in this type of art. But now you can invest in the asset class that's outperformed gold, real estate, and the SP 500 by nearly twofold between 1995 and 2020. We've partnered with Masterworks.io, billion dollar company that helps people invest like the 1%. So, like, when you go to Adam's house and you see all those Picassos and mm-hmm. things, now you can get priority access to their offering. Head to masterworks.io slash doubt. That's masterworks.io. 
io slash doubt right gary that's right see important disclosures at masterworks.io slash disclaimer you got all right so it's interesting you say that about the same people in tipper gore because last night gary will tell you i filmed something because i was so astonished you know there's a controversy right now about steve bannon Mm -hmm. steve bannon who was an advisor to President Trump, Mm -hmm. and then President Trump, and was in the campaign. Chief strategist was his term. So he was subpoenaed by the January 6th committee. Mm -hmm. So Bannon, who was also pardoned by then-President Trump, basically told them to go pound sand. Mm -hmm. And his basis was that President Trump had asserted executive privilege. Now, executive privilege has been around, and it is a creation of the executive branch to say, when I'm discussing something with someone and I'm running the country— I, I that should be a privileged discussion so I can get accurate information so I can have a free give and take. Mm-hmm. Now, okay, fine. Um, if you watch MSNBC, CNN, anything on the left, you would be astonished at what is being said. I sent a tape to Gary. Do you have it here? I, I do. The audio is a little tough, so I think we might be better okay, off so describing it. Okay, so I'm going to describe it. They have an ex-U.S. attorney, and, and as usual, all of a sudden— you you talk about we uh, we used to want to say something about Tipper Gore. Well, for some reason now the left has embraced former U.S. Uh, attorneys or prosecutors. Why I have no idea. But he gets on and he's pontificating that by asserting executive privilege, Bannon is pretty much invoking the fifth and admits he's guilty. Um, right. And that he's got guilty knowledge. And I'm sitting there saying, wait a second, how, why are you comparing executive privilege to the fifth? How about comparing executive privilege to attorney client privilege? That mm-hmm. you want to, we protect something sacrosanct because we want you to have a give and take with your attorney. By the way, this is the president of the United States, whether it's Trump, George W. Bush, Obama, they want, and they have all, by the way, asserted executive privilege. At this point, we try to make it look like you're hiding behind something when you're guilty, as opposed to somebody who actually had, has a basis, because it was used in 07, over 15 years ago by Paul Clement, who was the Solicitor General during the U.S. Attorney firings, irony of all irony. Why is it now that if you're asserting a plausible reason for executive privilege, that that means you must be guilty? And let me give you one other thing. Can you imagine what this same ex-U.S. attorney and this same, I think it was, it might have been Joy Reid, would have been saying if Trump had come out like Biden did last week, okay, and said, like Biden did, Department of Justice should go and should prosecute these uh, this criminal contempt. Is that correct, yeah, Gary? Yeah, he was saying that, that he hopes the Justice Department prosecutes anyone who flaunts a, a subpoena from the January 6th commission. To which the Justice Department... Let me get the exact quote just because I love it so much. I mean, it's so aggressive. But they would be calling him a dictator. Right. They'd, they'd be calling Trump but, a they'd dictator. Be, they, they would. They, they, we, would have, we would have drawn and quartered him. So here's a quote from the DOJ. The Department of Justice will make its own independent decisions in all prosecutions based solely on the facts and the law, period. Period, full stop. Yeah. Oh. Talk about a pushback there. Hello. And and just all I'm asking for, as somebody who for decades has done criminal defense, stop misleading people. Stop embracing the prosecutorial line. Stop being intellectually dishonest. Well, it's sort of like saying, I mean, what they do, and, and this is probably the reason we're in the pickle we are is uh, we we always get back to experts you know what i mean right and you know they put on the experts who will do their bidding for them and it's essentially you know you're an expert in fields i'm an expert in other fields uh, but they get the expert on that will say what they want them to say, and then they hide behind their title, former this, former that, For, FBI, as if that gives you, wait, whatever. A, former U.S. attorney. How many cases did you ever try? I, I, I don't think I've ever met a U.S. attorney who's tried 10 jury trials as a prosecutor. Well, on this subject, uh, they're looking to get the phone records. They want to subpoena uh, you know, the, the AT&T or whoever, Sprint or whoever it is, to start uh, getting phone records of Congress people who may have been in communication 
yada, yada, yada on uh, January 6th. Uh, where do you come down on that? The, look, the same thing. The You can't, if you've got evidence, if you've got probable cause, they may, if you've got somebody who has given you information, I heard, for instance, and this is a hypothetical, it's not uh, necessarily correct, Mark Meadows conceded to me that he and the president had a conversation with somebody and they were setting up the overthrow and stopping um, uh, violently January 6th uh, deliberations by Congress. That's probable cause. If you're saying Trump gave a speech and exhorted people to stop the steal, and then this ended up happening because he heated people up, that's not probable cause. Well, if we reverse engineer it a little bit, they're, they've not charged anyone with an insurrection. They're charging them with parading and trespassing and stepping tra- on monuments. Stepping on monuments. So Which, how do you, by the way, how do you move? It's because, you know, the, the how do you move forward with a case where you have so you, you have the perpetrator? I mean, it's almost like you caught the perpetrator. Uh, they're being charged with jaywalking and rolling through a, a four way stop and you're moving forward on your manslaughter charge, you know, but they're not, that's not what they're being charged for. How, how does how do you keep moving forward with? insurrection if the people that were involved in the insurrection aren't being charged with an insurrection? We're more than 10 months removed from January 6th. Um, uh, the, as far as I can tell, the federal judiciary has been making statements in the, during these sentencing, and when I say federal judiciary, judges who are sentencing these people keep questioning the prosecutors or, in many cases, excoriating for lack of a better term, the prosecutors, for not being more um, heavy-handed, if you will, or not bringing charges. What nobody is talking about, and this is somewhat frustrating when you put on these ex-AUSAs who keep, you know, on one hand they're saying this, why doesn't somebody ask some question? You used to be a prosecutor. What does it tell you if 10 months later your brethren, your former colleagues to at the, the judge. office— yeah. Right. What does it tell what does it tell you if they have not brought these charges? What is what is the problem? Why why are you all of a sudden sudden losing a judicial role, abdicating a I think it's abdicating your judicial role and becoming an advocate. Right. Why? Which is uh which is definitely what's going on because some of the judges are giving out harsher sentences than what the prosecutors are asking for. Correct. And that is their prerogative in the federal system. And I understand that as well. The federal judges can enhance. They can um, they can go below what the guidelines are. They, uh, now the guidelines are permissive. What I do not understand is why the next set of questions is not being asked. The, uh, the amount of resources that has been thrown into these investigations is substantial. I mean, you're talking about close to 600 people who have been either prosecuted or investigated, probably close to 1,000. They have brought charges against a wide array of those people. And as you stated, they have not brought charges charges as far as anything that would be treason or insurrection may happen. I mean, I've often said here on the show, the federal system moves at a glacial pace, but you would think it would have happened within uh, 10 months. I mean, we're, we're looking at, we can see over the horizon, the one year anniversary of January 6th. What is the reason for that? Could it be, let me just posit something um, unbelievable. Could it be that they have evaluated these cases hundreds of times over, they being the prosecutors, and they're exercising their prosecutorial discretion and saying, we have a duty as a prosecutor to only file cases we can prove beyond a reasonable doubt. That's our duty. And they're doing their duty. They they do not believe, all of these prosecutors do not believe they can prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. Could that be the case? And God forbid, could somebody articulate that and say that without being stoned to death? There's a great uh, clip uh, of the aforementioned Joy Reid, Gary Confine, when he's basically uh, explaining that uh, Ashley Babbitt, the one who was shot in the neck, was uh, a trained killer, uh, trained by the military 
to uh, kill. I think it was the, well, na- I, I, the I, Navy Gary, to kill. G- Gary sent me a opinion piece. I want to say who I don't remember who wrote it. From um, the uh, L.A. Times? Yeah, maybe Goldberg something. Yeah, was it yeah, Nicholas, Nicholas Goldberg? Goldberg? Yeah. Okay. I read this, and I and it was fascinating to me. He posits a whole um, thesis based on the fact that Ashley Babbitt was yelling and screaming as other people were breaking, in, breaking the glass. And I said, this is really um, uh, a, a wonderful thing. If you were a civilian... And you shot Ashley Babbitt because somebody is trying to break into a building. You would not. You would get. Char- you'd get arrested, mm-hmm. and you'd get charged the same day. If you're a cop, you probably would be suspended immediately. If this were any other building, now you can say, "Oh, this is the, this is the violent overthrow of American democracy." I get it. I understand that. It's a great. It's a great line, except, like I said, 10 months later, we don't have one single case that has been brought under that theory beyond a reasonable doubt. You cannot shoot somebody who is unarmed. You do not have that ability in in almost every jurisdiction, um, except potentially stand your ground states, who's unarmed, who's breaking into a commercial building. Well, I think what you're kind of dancing around while drilling down— which Mark can do simultaneously, is uh, something we've been discussing uh, on this program, which is the same people that are essentially applauding the citizen being shot by the cop. Um, these are the same people, I'm sure if you asked them about what was, uh, remember that incident with the uh, L.A., uh, Congress person, or sorry, the uh, L.A. Oh God, I don't know what her title was, but her husband won out and was sort of waving a gun around. It was the DA. The it DA. was Jackie Lacey's, Jackie Lacey. Jackie so Lacey's husband. Jackie Lacey had a mob show up at his house, uh, uh, had a mob show up at her house. Uh, the husband pulls out a pistol and goes out to the front porch and kind of waves it around. Now, the same people that are applauding the cop that shot Ashley Babbitt would like the book thrown at the husband who went out and waved the gun around, didn't fire a shot, just waved the gun around because the angry mob had gathered. And then there's the couple out of St. Louis, I think it's St. Louis, right. who had the angry mob break down a gate and show up uh, on their doorstep. They came out and waved guns around. These same people would like the book thrown at the people who never fired a shot but want the one who did kill a person exonerate. Now, that's hypocrisy. And it's now also- it's, it's hypocrisy that's based on a political uh, leaning. And that's what we're that's what you're pushing back on. That's, if, if you I, I, don't, it is, if you're against if you're, you're against, against gun violence and cops and cop shooting citizens. And, and by the way, you're you never stop being outraged by this and rightfully so. But in this case, no problema. And, well, and, and you're going to write all sorts of op-ed pieces justifying it, but it's really hard to get around unarmed five foot two woman shot in the face. Well, the the idea of saying she's a trained killer it reminds me of those people who used to say Muhammad Ali once had his hands declared a right. deadly weapon. By right. the way. Everybody's hands can be a deadly weapon. You can have a great bodily injury based upon ex- uh, the force used in a in a fist. More um, people killed in the United States by fists than by rifles. I every I year. have I have no doubt about that. I can't. How many people have been killed by a fight where one of the people? fall down backwards and hit their head on the right. cement. I've had right. that case, that murder case, I've defended on at least 10 occasions. Uh, well, we'll see if uh, Gary can find that that clip. It's uh, it's quite it's quite entertaining. Well, and so back to your Babbitt. I, once again, I, I'm not endorsing and I'm not sanctifying or saying Ashley Babbitt rushing the Capitol is a good thing. What I am saying is, do you get to use excessive force when the cop, number one, does not know 
whether she's a trained killer, which it would be objection irrelevant, motion to exclude. Diminutive females normally aren't the trained killers in terms of threat assessment. Right. And so when somebody is doing a purported legal analysis and they're saying, oh, well, she was a trained killer, so therefore it was justified. Excuse me, you didn't know at the time you pulled the trigger that she was a trained killer. Your mental state is all that's at issue, not whatever facts arise around the person who's deceased. That's a basic legal principle. Uh, I right. can play you guys the audio if you would yeah. like. Maybe if she was wearing her Air Force uniform, <laughs> one could get a little closer to that goal. I don't even think, I don't but, think you uh, judge. If you just do, to quote you, the thought experiment where you strip out the all of the extraneous ideology and you just say, okay, somebody is trying to break into a public spot and they're breaking the glass. And it's not her, by the way, necessarily who's breaking the glass. Do I get to use deadly force on somebody who's screaming at me? Right. Is it that, was she Air Force or Navy? Air Force. Air Force. And by the way, what was she, a helicopter mechanic or, uh, you know, radar tech? You know what I mean? I mean, it's not like, she was a paratrooper. I'm, I'm guessing, but anyway, we'll we'll play the uh, we'll play the audio. Ashley Babbitt, who is a trained Air Force specialist, trained by our tax dollars to kill. She was a military member. If she'd gotten through that door, God knows what kind of harm she could have done. His supporters who attack the Capitol are terrorists. It's two plus two equals four stuff. Like Ashley Babbitt, all those who attack the Capitol are terrorists because the FBI director has said it was an act of terrorism. Ashley Babbitt is the woman that was leading the mob that was about to storm uh, the House floor, uh, and she was shot by a brave officer who was the last line of defense for many members of Congress, and many of these members were the slowest, least mobile members because they were having the hardest time getting out. If they had been overrun by that mob, uh, people would have been killed. Okay, well, first of all, slowest, least mobile. Okay, Um, got it. But... I one more time. Well, and if also you got to charge doing... him with terror. If the FBI said there were terrorists and she was a terrorist, then how come no one's charged as a terrorist? What? That's I just can we do a legal analysis yes. and separate it out from the ideology or whatever agenda everybody's got? They're storming a public building. That's the storming. Clearly, they're storming mm-hmm. a public building. Do you get to use deadly force for storming a public building? Well, it's going to take Jerry Nadler about three days to get the <laughs> fuck out of there. <laughs> he is no pixie. He is not fleet-footed. He's not what you call a mobile quarterback. I, I just, I, how do you, uh, can you imagine, once again, your thought experiment, um, I I am just, I could give another example. The I remember the brouhaha here in Los Angeles when the CHP officer was using his fist to throttle a homeless woman who was in mental distress off, I think, the 10 freeway. Do you mm-hmm. remember this? Mm-hmm. Gary may have the video of it. Um, <laughs> do you, if he had pulled out his gun and just shot her dead All right. and just said, you know, she, this was a public highway, she was impeding the public highway, I'm going to shoot her dead, would you... What, Joy what Reid would, would defend that officer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, trained killer. She's been trained, trained to kill he's a, he's in the a Air trained Force. Trained killer. No, wait, because she she I, wasn't a Marine, by the way. Uh, well, the by Air the Force way, does less training I think to kill. The statement, if you dissect it, was she was in the military or had been in the military. Therefore, she's a trained killer. Right. 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 It wasn't. She's a sniper. She right. was a sniper. It wasn't. She was accurate with rifles or anything else. Nope. She was in the military, therefore she's a trained killer. Right. Military equals killer. But it's essentially like saying the cop shot the guy because the guy was trained in mixed martial arts. But if the guy's just wearing a T-shirt and sweatpants, Joy Reid, then how does the officer know he was trained in mixed martial arts? By the way. what um, you're saying. Exactly. And by the way, um, if Chauvin had said, I knew George Floyd 
was a security guard and had training and blah 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 what do you think what do you think she would have said about the defense if they had posited that as a defense in I, that case i don't think she would have been supportive of you Chauvin. don't no, you're such a that's cynic. the joy read so- i know what did she do in the air force that that is sort of my question because i i hope it's something novel like nurses aid or <laughs> <laughs> transportation she tech or something. Tunes up the I mean, even if she flew F-18s, it's still not a trained killer. I can tell you that she was a security forces airman who achieved the rank of senior airman or E-4. I'll, I'll look into a little more of what that means. All right. No idea. Maybe that's a trained killer. Well... Right. He saw that look in her eye. Exactly. That, and knew. That, you only, that only a trained killer possesses. <laughs> yeah, I think what we're talking about and why we're mocking here is Joy Reid's really should be agnostic. And if she's going to be consistent on the side of the victim, because nobody's talked more about police brutality and um, and force and overreach than Joy Reid has in the last 18 months. And just be consistent. I, and I agree. It, I mean, how do you, uh, I mean, if you're going to be somebody who, and I do it every day, who is going to take on qualified immunity, police excessive force, and all of that, that's what I do for a living, then how do you, how do you just embrace why do you get to pick and choose what is excessive and what's not? I mean, that's well. Really... Look, I mean, the, I I don't know if Joy Reid knows it. I don't know if her, her producers know it. But the the person who was breaking in voted for Trump, and that's it. We're we're now done with the legal analysis and assessment. Go ahead, Gary. So I can tell you about her rank. The rank of senior airman is a transition period from journeyman to non-commissioned officer. It is essential that airmen develop supervisory and leadership skills through professional military experience and individual study. So it oh, seems well, like it's go. sort she's of a trained killer. she was trained she was killer. promoted trained. a few times. Yeah, she's a journey journeyman killer. <laughs> she's apprenticing to kill. What do you think her body count is? <laughs> In double digits. Like, what do you think she's racked up over her career in terms? Like, how many notches in that holster of hers? Like, I, mean, I, I you know, she's over de- under is eighteen. She's deceased, and I don't want to. I don't want to uh, give anybody the wrong impression. But it really, uh, it really is astonishing to me that 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 you can that excessive force is only in the eye of the beholder. It's just too much. Is there a case for her? As long as we're talking. To an attorney, yes, um, yes. And I who is she bringing it against? She would bring it against the Capitol Police. Mm-hmm. I don't know why. Um, I don't know. Even though the uh, U.S. Supreme Court twice in the past week has sanctioned sanctioned meaning approved of um, uh, qualified immunity again, which is just an outrage. Uh, the why she has not. Uh, alleged that that is excessive forces beyond me. All right, let me hit Geico, and then we'll uh, shift gears, get another subject going. Do you own, do you rent your home? We do one or the other, and then there is your automotive policy. How about you get your bundle work in? Geico makes it easy to bundle your homeowners or renter's insurance along with your automotive policy. It's a good thing, too, because you already have so much to do around your house. So go to geico.com. Get a quote and see just how much you could be saving when you get your bundle working at Geico. That is at Geico.com. Uh, I know we've got a few more topics we want to get to, but I just wanted to give you guys a heads up. There's some breaking news that I'm going to wedge in at the end of the show, and we'll be covering on Beyond as the fo- story unfolds. All right. If you'd like well, to talk. you can't just, just like that. What watch, is it? watch me. Yeah, I just did That's it. It's so, so breaking that in 20 minutes there may be more information, so I'm, I'm watching. Why don't you guys talk in and out? In and out. Okay. In and out is now in and out. Uh, okay, so uh, to set the table, uh, pardon the pun for in and out. <laughs> in and out does not franchise. Right. They they they're all, it's all family owned. Correct. They, a large portion of the family died in a jet jet crash in Orange County, leaving like one surviving granddaughter. And yes, yeah, woman was in a her big 30s, fan of Alex and Annie. Yep, I've absolutely. Seen her, I've seen her on the cover of some magazine, bangled up. I think at the time of the crash, which was in the late '90s or early 2000s, there was still a grandmother around, and that girl was in her 
mid to late mid to late teens, I believe. She's a little bit younger than me, and she is now the chief executive and kind of running the whole right. Show. So their whole thing is we're family run. We do what we do. We're not going to franchise it to some Yahoo who's going to start serving gorditos or something. We do what we do, and we want control. They're also religious. I think the bottom of their cup is a three sixteen or something on it. It's different depending on what size, but they all have Bible verses on it. And for the longest time, the reason they wouldn't expand, I don't know if this is a well-known fact, but they would never open a store that was more than one day drive from their beef processing plants because they wanted control over the freshness of their beef. Mm. Wow. I why wanted... is it always right next to a freeway? That's where they, I, I don't know. I mean, I guess that's where you can get away with cows that <laughs> smell like that. Yeah, I remember I remember looking into it 20 years ago. I was like, someone's got to take this to the Midwest. These people go nuts with this. Uh, they wouldn't have it, you yeah. know. And so they run their own business. They're conservative. They're religious. And that's how they do it. And now they've said they're not going to be checking vax cards or mandates. They're not going to be essentially the the arm for the government where we we are not here to be deputized here's a direct quote. check your policy we refuse to become the vaccination police for any government the chain's legal officer said right and by uh, the way here in la county the sheriff refuses to be vaccination sheriff for the county and he's taken quite a bit of blowback for that and so they shut down the one in san francisco on fisherman's wharf correct that's the only one they have in the city of san francisco proper Right. So uh, your thoughts and then my thoughts. And just to be clear, they did not shut it down. Health officials shut them down. They have since reopened with the inside of the business closed. Right. Well, my thoughts are I've been getting all of I won't uh, say where, but I've been getting pushback for the last three weeks because at various locations of places that we have at restaurants, the health department is coming in. They're timing people as they come in. They're they're tr- citing people who are not showing their vax card, even though the uh, if you're less than ten minutes, that's not supposed to be checked. And I, it's so they're putting a stopwatch on people. Yeah. And you don't if you're just in and out like you're picking up takeout, then you don't need to show the vax card. Correct. And that's not being that is being um, uh, how should I put it? I know that you might find this surprising, but some health inspectors have actually pushed the envelope on this by timing how long somebody's in waiting for their takeout. Wow. Yeah. So that's what you're. So you're really between your attorney hat and your chef's hat. You're really on the front lines of this. I I'm beyond this. This whole thing has reached such absurd levels. First of all, you know, we were having this discussion this morning before I got on the air. The um, the vax mandates. Um, while I understand and I suppose. People think that's a good thing, and um, it's a way to encourage people to do it. The fact that that the data just came out that J and J wanes so uh, so quickly, and that you then need a booster with one of the others, Moderna or Pfizer, and that you still can get a breakthrough infection. By the way, I'm Exhibit A, so I had J and J. I got a breakthrough infection. Um, arguably, that me I didn't have as bad an effect as I would have if I didn't have the J&J. I don't know that. It might be because I worked out. I'll accept that for, for um, argument purposes. But the fact that I now have natural immunity and the antibodies, um, yet – What's next? Do I have to, if I, because I was J&J and I didn't get a booster, am I then not going to be ent- uh, able to enter a courthouse or not be able to go into a restaurant? There is a myriad of possibilities, and it is absurd at a certain point. In fact, I just read this morning that in England, they're now calling for um, re- COVID restrictions again because they believe that there, this winter there's going to be a resurgence and they are seeing troubling statistics. Right. So, well, so you can make the uh, – and I'm just going to say it again and I've said it a thousand times and I understand it. All of this is based on unelected bureaucrats who 
are, if you were to cross-examine them, wouldn't last 12 minutes in a courtroom. But nobody, nobody wants to say that. Nobody wants to articulate the fact that these people, it's, they claim, they cloak themselves with science when they're being anti-scientific. Well, they've shown their hand. They're pro-government and they're pro-big hand of government and they're pro-whatever mandates uh, they can they can pass out. Uh, to me, sort of psychologically, if you really just step back and look at this, you can talk about COVID, you can talk about disease, you can talk about safety. Most things are just an excuse to do what you want to do, you know, and Ron DeSantis does not have the same agenda Gavin Newsom has. Um, And so COVID doesn't really give him an excuse to do what he wants to do. And thus he steps back and says, live and let live. Here's a couple. Here's some thoughts. Here's some policy. But we're going to live and let live. And Newsom and L.A. City Council and Garcetti and everyone go, oh, good. This is an opportunity to do what we want to do, which is essentially over govern. I well, mean, you, you can call it whatever you want. It's essentially too much governing. Well, but that's when, what they that's, that's what they like. And, and then you could argue that their constituency enjoys the crate training. They want the over governing. Yeah. And that's when it kicks in, because I, what's going on in Florida? What's going on in Texas? What's going on everywhere else where you can go to an in and out burger, although they haven't franchised there, <laughs> but you can. They got them in Texas. They got them in Texas? Yeah. Oh, good. All right. You can go to Texas, go to the burger. What, what is so different about what's there versus what's at the Fisherman's Wharf? Well, the what's there is a government that would like to have its citizens live and let live and make their own decisions and let businesses have autonomy and make their own business decisions involving safety and protocol with some from the from the government you're not allowed to have mayonnaise that's 140 degrees you know <laughs> they have they, it's not no government it's some government versus california which is all the government and so we keep going you keep talking about the science and the data why aren't they following the science they're not following the science because they have no interest in science this is a reason for them to mobilize and in, in overreach, and that's what they're doing. This could be about killer bees coming in from the Texas panhandle. It could be about a myriad of, of other subjects. They are saying if, if you were talking about killer bees and you're in Florida, uh, then Ron DeSantis would say, uh, well, put on your bee hat before you go uh, to get your mail. Uh, Gavin Newsom would say you have to lock yourself in your house. Now, it's not the subject, and, and I think people like you and Dr. Drew and other people like that that are sort of insane pragmatists are sort of keep going, well, here's the data out of Israel, and here's the data out of Florida, and here's the data out of London, England. Here's the data. Why, why are you doing what, – what's with the no outdoor dining? Uh, let me show you the data. And they're like, we're not interested in the data. Now, they say we're, we're interested in the data. So it essentially becomes a parent that's interested in punishing the kid, and the kid keeps saying, I can show you my phone. I never left the house. Here's me sending a text at midnight. I was in my bedroom. Yeah, yeah. I'm punishing you because you left your bedroom. And you're going, I have data. And they're going, no, no, moving ahead. That's what they're doing. So the confusion is, why aren't they following the data? The answer is they don't they're not interested in the data. They're well, interested the in overreach. Time, at the same time that you're shamed for not following the science, which is aka the data. The, but if you have a discussion about the data or the science, then no, you're you're an anti vaxxer. I'm not right. anti vaxxer. I'm I um, How but, many people? I, I would I would bet you, and I know this to be so. Um, there are anti vaxxers out there. M- most do not have a microphone or pulpit. Uh, the lion's share of the people that are labeled with as anti vaxxers have been vaccinated. How do you square that? You know, That's Ben right. Shapiro's an anti-vaxxer. Who's been vaccinated? What, in what other era are you an anti-whatever except for you've done it? 
Well, I I will also say I'm, the highest jury verdict I've ever gotten has been against Pfizer Pharmaceutical. We spent an inordinate amount of time picking that jury. Do you know why? Because virtual, and this was in Santa Clara County, where you've got a highly, highly intelligent and um, uh, uh, jury pool. I mean, they're educated, very well educated. And I can't tell you the number of jurors who, when I would ask, can you be fair in this case, would raise their hand and say, I wouldn't trust a pharmaceutical company or any of anybody else uh, connected to a pharmaceutical company. I just can't be fair. And that was kind of they highly intelligent. They understand it. And mind you, after that trial, which was six or eight weeks, and I saw some of the testimony by their chief medical officer and others there, I had the same skepticism. I mean, they, you know, they used to call. Uh, I was telling somebody this story today. I remember the guy talking about adverse events, adverse events. And I'd say, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Is an AE, an adverse event, is that a death? And the guy would say, well, yeah. And I'd say, so that adverse event when you're doing your trial on this particular drug, you don't call it a death? You just call it an adverse event? Yeah, that's what we call it. And so the, the idea that somehow we're unfailingly accepting what comes out as they're making billions of dollars. I'm not saying these vaccines aren't miraculous. To some degree, the speed in which they were developed and their efficacy is miraculous. But the kind of craziness that has happened surrounding it is inexplicable to me. I can hold both of those thoughts in my head. It can be a miraculous the uh, like a land speed record of a vaccine, Moderna, Nubar, who's the founder, has done incredible things, should win a Nobel Prize. However, th- to, to then go from that scientific kind of Magellan-like discovery to these mandates, which are insanity, is something I just don't understand. Well, Gary, why don't you uh, get to what you were teasing um, uh, sure, absolutely. Minutes ago, like I said, it it is an evolving story. So uh, we will be covering it on uh, Beyond this weekend. But it appears uh, everything's pointing to Brian Lundry's remains have been found in a Florida swamp, and he is most likely dead. I said he was dead. Oh, I've known. Yeah, same. I've suspected it as well. But now the FBI is starting to confirm it. They're on on site. They've got a you know for a, a remains dog out there. So. Where's the dog in this mix? Is dog left side? this morning to uh, go back to Colorado to get his ankle fixed, and he is going to be pissed when he touches down at DIA. Oh, so he's, uh, he's prattling the air, and he's out. Yeah. Well, poor dog. Poor dog. Why, why did you suspect that? Um, I, I don't think you can really hide if in everyone is looking for you in this sort of modern age you know and i don't think you can survive you know unless you're jeremiah johnson or some tracker or woodsman from 200 years ago i don't think you can just disappear into a swamp and sort of weeks or months will go by while you're living off the land and you know no helicopter with heat heat sensing radar is gonna see movement like it just it seemed inconceivable to me and again He wasn't, you know, ex Delta Force, you know, man who can, you know, who can skin a gator and fillet it. You know, seemed he seemed like a a pretty domesticated guy with the gamping or the camping or the vamping or whatever it is in a van, the glamping. Should be vamping, right? I mean, for him, yeah, they were in a van, so that makes most sense to me. It didn't look that glamorous. That van also was not, you know, when I think of a van and you're going across, I think of an econo line. I don't think of that. No, that's every, a compact van. Every, I'm not laying down in that thing. Everyone's got a ring doorbell with a camera on mm. it. Everyone's got a cell phone with a camera on it. There's, you know, air every time you pass an ATM. You know, watch any of those Bourne movies. Like every time you pass an ATM, it films you. you know, there was going to be, he just wasn't going anywhere. And, and he wasn't living off the land. And I was assuming that he just went into the Everglades or the swamp and killed himself. Yeah, I, I unless I mean, it, unless he did it recently and that comes out and they say that it's, you know, it was a very recent wound. I, I was impressed with how far he survived. I thought that this would go four or five days. It's been what? Several weeks. 
Well, my assertion is he went to the swamp, killed himself on day two. It's possible. And has been just basically there. What we're going to see, because apparently what was reported this morning, there was a video that came out recently where the guy who looked a lot like him was riding a bike. Well, that bike was found this morning. So if they can connect that bike to him, then they know he was alive at the very I saw least that. in the video. Well, so how so you far mean that spotting the spot of him in Mexico was not true? Not true. How far was the bike trail away from where they found him? It was apparently in the in the similar proximity. Well, that's interesting. So, so like I said, this is all happening right yeah. now. I'm getting my reporting from one source. I don't know. You know, we'll, it was we'll pretty see grainy the bike thing. Yeah, and also, you can't put an APB out on a skinny white guy on a bicycle. Right. That that covers every human on a bicycle. Well, they were all they have. I think they were going off of uh, the bicycle being found and matching the video and attempting to print, like dust the the bike for prints because the bike is pretty distinct in the video. It would be interesting to find out how far that bike was away from the body. All right, let me tell you about Lightstream credit card bills keeping you up at night, double digit interest rates. Be smart, pay off credit card balances with credit card cons. Uh, consolidation loan from Lightstream. Rates start at 4.98 APR with auto pay and excellent credit. Rate is fixed, so it'll never go up for the life of the loan. Uh, you can get loans from 5000 bucks to 100000 bucks. Absolutely no fees. Even get your money as soon as the day you apply. And just for our listeners, apply now for a special interest rate discount and save even more. Only way to get the discount is to go to lightstream.com slash doubt. That's L-I-G-H-T-S-T-R-E-A-M dot com slash doubt. Right, Gary? That's absolutely right. Subject to credit approval, rates range from 4.98 APR to 19.99 APR and include a half percent auto pay discount. Lowest rate requires excellent credit. Terms and conditions apply and offers are subject to change without notice. Visit lightstream.com slash doubt for more information. It says that this was that it, what it says here that I've been able to find in these moments is that the area where he was riding in the video is three hours from the laundry family home. It does not say specifically the bike relative to the video, but by the time Beyond a Reasonable Doubt comes out, Jerry will have this. We'll have that. Filthy well, it's the bike relative to the body, I right. think, is what. Right, what we so need he to jumped find. off the bike, and then. But then it would be the bike relative to the body, relative to the video as well, so you could sort of gauge how. Yeah. F- well, to me, it's all just about where did they find the bike, and if the body's 75 yards away, that was him on the bike. If it's, you exactly. know, two counties over, then that was another dude on a bike. Sure. But yeah. uh, we'll figure it out on uh, Beyond a Reasonable Doubt. All right, you can go to amcrolla.com October 30th, next Saturday, or this Saturday, depending on how we do it's the next Saturday. It's right? going to be next Saturday because we're releasing this on Thursday. Oh, okay. Uh, I'll be at the Improv there, the Bray Improv with Rob Riggle for the uh, 1 o'clock show. We're taping that show. Uh, Leno's doing a show with me, too, but that one's sold out. So wow. a couple left for the uh, Riggle early show. Go to amcrolla.com for all the live shows. What do you got, Mark? Gigi's in Palm Springs. Uh, open. Get, uh, get down there at the V, Palm Springs. Naya is still open at uh, the Capri Southampton, Casa Tropicana in San Clemente. Downtown uh, 10E, Mediterranean Tapas, Engine Company 28 downtown LAX, and Prova Pizzeria, Grand Central Terminal, and Moxie Times Square. Bring your Vax card until next time <laughs> and your stopwatch. Until next time, it's Adam Crow from Mark Garrigo saying mahalo. Thanks for listening to Reasonable Doubt. Tune in next Saturday for an all-new episode.